Now, now pass over to Dr. Elvin Ng to share his uh, session on living the good life. Over to you, Elvin. Thank you very much, Brother Bobby. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to all of you, wherever you are in the world. Um, streaming live to you now from my dining table. Uh, of course, my background is not exactly this. This is uh, just uh, one of those backgrounds to show that I'm uh, kind of living the good life, but in a lie, but that's how the internet is, isn't it? Anyway, speaking of internet, you know how we just had our puja just now. Um, it is also important to uh, pay homage to the powers that be to have and maintain good internet. So you may want to do it with me. It's very easy. Just one phrase. Repeat after me. Om Nama Wi-Fi. Oh, there you go. So as for the Wi-Fi gods. Right. So early in the morning, already cracking uh, jokes. Don't know whether funny or not. It's up to you. Um, but we also can have a, a puja. Uh, this is starting the talk already. How to have a good life or the secrets of the good life. Um, the good life also involves not being able to remember much, so I don't even remember my own topic. Um, you can have a particular type of chanting that is actually very universal. You don't even have to understand the contents to feel good and joyful once you are finished with the chanting or maybe even during the chanting. Would you like to try? I mean, those of you who don't like to chant, don't worry, you don't have to repeat after me. But this particular chant, um, I can kind of guarantee you would bring you that uplifted feeling. So let's try this. Okay, repeat after me. This is again a universal chanting. You don't need to be Buddhist also for this. Let's see how it goes. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Go to Korea, say, anyong, ha, say, oh. Eat at mama, order, kopi, oh. Ya, ba, da, ba, do. Sku, bi, do, bi, do. Do, wa, di, di. Di, di, dam, di, di, do. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Well, there you go. How's that? All right. Nothing in the chat. <laughs> probably all gone home already. And then again, you're probably watching from home. So, oops. Anyway, all right. So, there's a bit of a short puja before my talk. And given the topic of my talk, I think it's going to be quite a short one. Um, when I was asked uh, to, to give a talk on this, I was kind of uh, laughing at, at myself. I mean, this is just jokingly. Don't take it too seriously, okay? Um, asking me to talk about the way to a good life um, <laughs> and coming from a Buddhist uh, society. It's kind of like, hmm, Buddha didn't tell you. Uh. <laughs> anyway, all right. Again, jokes aside. Um, I'm coming from the psychological perspective and being a psychologist, there are tons and tons of theories and uh, research findings that have uh, given evidence on what we can do to live the good life. So I'm just going to uh, give it straight to you so that we don't waste time. Your good life, um, based on longitudinal research, meaning research that has been carried out for a very, very long time, at least 50, 60 years, all right, uh, all over the world, and uh, particularly in, in universities that are very, very famous, such as Harvard, Stanford, they all have found that the single most important factor that contributes to a good quality of life is not your physical health, actually. And we all know it's not your financial health either. Yeah? Money doesn't buy your happiness unless, unless you know how to spend it correctly. But anyway, it is not uh, wealth. It is not health, but it is actually in your quality relationships, yeah? your social health. And this is why if you look at uh, what we are doing today um, and what BGF is about, as well as many other religious organizations, it is about community. So if your community is healthy, you are more likely to live a good life because the 
environment around you is healthy and joyful and happy um, and comfortable. So you live in a system. We all live in a system, whether we like it or not. And in order for us to be well, we need to ensure that our system is well. And who is our system? What's our system? Basically, our community. So there you go. Tada, end of story. That's it. Done for my talk already. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So now that you know that social health is the single most important factor for a good life, what can we do about it? And this is where I want to introduce to you the five C's of the good life. You know about the five C's of, you know, the traditional five C's on how, how to find us spouse, usually more for women to know how to find a good husband, must have the five C's, right? What are the five C's? Normally cash, credit card, car, condo, and what else? Hmm. Career, all right? But we know that, that five C's, they don't necessarily give you a good life. Now, these are very, very material five C's. Um, then there are the other five C's of relationship. And this is something that gives you even more depth into that attraction. Um, see if I can remember. I came up with these five C's myself and yet I can forget. All right. Now the first C of uh, a good relationship is care. There you go. Now this is again within the context of social health, right? To be social, to be within a good community, you need to know how to form friendships, how to form relationships and how to maintain them. You want to make friends, keep friends, and make even more friends because every now and then you'll lose friends along the way. Yeah, Either they move away or they pass away or they just unfriend you. Right? Either way, it helps to make lots of friends, especially international friends because that's a cheap way to travel. All right, so the five C's of forming friendship, relationship. First one is care. Second is compassion, right? Caring provides safety for others and safety for others are more likely to give safety to you. Safety, nurturance, that's care. Compassion is about wanting to provide comfort. Yeah. So care, compassion, and commitment. Friendship is about commitment. You want to keep on com uh, working on a friendship to continue that care and compassion. And on top of that, there's also conscientiousness. There's a fourth C. Your care, compassion, commitment, conscientiousness. Quite a long word, may be difficult to spell, but never mind. Um, conscientiousness looks towards how we can dedicate ourselves to the relationship by doing the right things, putting the things in place, being, being uh, dedicated in that sense. For the long term, for the long term is where you know commitment comes in. And last one. Last C is for comedy. Yes, why you think I'm like cracking jokes here and there? Because lightheartedness helps to bind people together because it is attractive. There's a nice, joyful feeling. So go learn some jokes there. Be funny, not funny, never mind. Just try again. It's okay. Sometimes you become funny trying to be funny. Um, all right. So five Cs of building relationships and also maintain relationships care, compassion, um, commitment, conscientiousness, and comedy. How's that? Can I? Right. So you got five C's already um, <clears throat> of relationships. And now we move on to the good life. We started by me saying that um, the key to a good life is to have meaningful and quality relationships. All right, so I went through the traditional uh, five C's of attraction and now the five C's of relationship. I'm going to now go through the five C's. There are lots of fives right now. I've got 15 C's to think about already, but never mind. And the last 10 are the more important ones. So the five C's of the good life. Um, this is from me. Yeah? So don't, don't go Googling the five C's of the good life because you're not likely to find it unless, of course, I write a book on it. Maybe you can. So thinking about social health, the first C of the good life is community. Makes sense, isn't it? Community is where people come together. And the thing about a good life is we have found out from tons of research also is that sense of belonging. 
when you belong to a community and you know you're part of the community, there's this sense of belonging, right? That uh, you will be taken care of by this community. It is safe in this community, secure, safety, safety in numbers, basically, and that you are accepted. So community is very important. And this is why if you look at any, uh, well, any, anywhere, basically, a lot of people just want to join clubs, join organizations, join this, join that, just to be part of a community. Because a sense of belonging, again, from research, we know is one of the single most important, one of, not the single, one of the most important um, factors that keeps us alive. Because if you lose that sense of belonging, you're likely to become depressed because there's no belonging. You feel very isolated and a lot of people don't like isolation. Some people like it because they perhaps are uh, introverts, they like being alone, that's fine. But still, being alone doesn't mean you're, you don't belong anywhere. One thing to be alone, but having that sense of belonging still is something that keeps you um, alive and, and you know, give, giving you meaning in life. So sense of belonging, that's where community is. And something that's very related to community is where you actually come together as a community. And that's the second C. Congregation, you congregate together. Yeah. Um, you know the phrase, birds of a feather flock together? Yes, that's, that's kind of like you know, birds of a feather. You want to sound a bit smarter than just saying birds of a feather flock together. You can say that ornithological species of congruent plumage congregate in close, close proximity. Mm, a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? But anyway, hope you get what I mean. Um, so this community, there's congregation, because community, you're just there in the community, but you need to congregate, all right? And congregation can also become a bit more organized. You can call it a club. That's a fifth, uh, third C. I can't count properly, sorry. It's one, two, three, many. So community, congregation, club, form a club, you know, for a particular reason, you know, to do something together. And when you form a club, there's automatic, you know, connection. Connection is the fourth C. So first one, community. Second one, congregation. Third one, club. The fourth one, connection. You find that all these four Cs are already connected. You, you cannot have community without connection. Right? You cannot have congregation without connection. You cannot have club without connection either. So fourth one, you know, it's very obvious. I just put connection there. So that, you know, there is that sense of relationship. Connection means you're related, all right? Club is membership. Membership gives you another kind of sense of belonging. Uh, congregation, connection, all this coming together gives you that whole idea of fellowship. You look into Christianity, you look into Islam, you look into any other religion. They are all very social religions. And all of the teachings within this, these religions point towards getting together, praying together, um, doing things together, basically, being generous and all the kindness, compassion kind of behaviors. You find this in all religions. They do that. And there's this sense of community. They congregate. Yeah, They form clubs even within the community. And it's all about connection, that sense of belonging, the brotherhood, sisterhood, fellowship. Okay. And one last C that comes out of all these four Cs of community, congregation, club, connection, is credibility. Now, credibility is not so much of qualification. I mean, you want to call it that way, you can also. Uh, it's more towards validation. Validation means you as an individual are accepted because you are credible enough to be accepted. And if you are credible, there is also this sense of self-efficacy that you are able to do something that is valued by other people. And therefore, you are accepted into the group, into the community, and you are also more likely to feel that you're relevant. If you know that you're able to do something that is accepted by other people, you are relevant. When you are relevant, you, are also, uh, you also belong to that group. There's this sense of belonging. Again, sense of belonging maintains, um, I would say, good quality of life because it gives you meaning. To live. We also know from tons of research that if you don't have that sense of belonging, if you don't feel validated by people, you feel isolated, and if you feel that if you're within the community, 
you are not really wanted, you feel like a burden to society. So feeling like a burden, um, feeling that you don't belong, these are two of the strongest factors that contribute to depression. That is what we have found out from research. And these two, the lack of belongingness, feeling like you're a burden, plus if uh, you also have very impulsive characteristics and if there's any kind of suicide ideation, you are also likely to actually try to take your own life. Mm, it can be that serious, which is why the opposite of feeling like a burden, feeling that you don't belong, is something we want to be focusing on even more. And this is by getting together as a community, supporting each other, nurturing each other, right? validating, accepting each other. Very, very important for a better quality of life. And there you go. That's in a nutshell, you know, what you can do for the good life based on social relationships and community. All right. Hopefully you're okay on that. So my main point is the way to a good life is forming a good, meaningful and sustainable community with, you know, quality relationships. Think about it. You wake up in the morning, you have a quarrel with your loved one, automatically your whole day probably you're going to suffer a lot, right? You suffer, they suffer. When they suffer, you suffer. You suffer, they suffer. So it's kind of like a cycle of suffering. That's because relationship is so strong that when something is slightly broken, you get affected. Yeah. So being a clinical psychologist, people ask me, what can we do to manage depression? I say, manage your relationship first. All right. Even though you say, oh, no, my relationship, relationship is good. I say, yeah, okay, fine. Carry on and make it even better. Because once you have got good relationships, a strong relationship, no matter how depressed you get, there's still that sense of belonging. All right. There's still that sense of validation, acceptance that keeps that depression from getting worse. These are the things that you all can do. And you don't need medication for this. If someone's on medication, fine. But medication doesn't give you that sense of relationship. Medication doesn't help you think in a way that is beneficial. Medication doesn't get you to do, to behave in a way that helps you feel better. But we as society, as a community, need to put in place all kinds of um, factors that contribute towards that sense of belonging. Yeah. So think about it. You want to focus on getting people feeling that they belong. And one of the best ways is just to accept them as they are, whoever they are. Listen, be curious. Okay. Right. Now, um, I want to have more time for q and I'm just going to go through the second part of my talk, which is to um, expand a bit further from just focusing on community, but also on yourself as an individual. My, um, I guess you can say the format for today is I've covered community fellowship, community, you know, the, the C's, friendships and things like that. I want to cover two more that um, talks more about you as an individual. What can you do as an individual for a better quality of life? And these two things, firstly, rational thinking, and secondly, behavioral activation, or something that may sound simpler, I would prefer to call it healthy habits. Why did I say behavioral activation? That's because that's the, I guess, the official term that we as psychologists use to mean doing the things that are meaningful to you that also contributes to your productivity and well-being. That's behavioral activation slash healthy habits. Okay, so apart from making more friends, having a sense of community, you need to also learn how to be more rational in the way you think by developing beliefs that are more healthy. All of us as human beings, we are pretty messed up creatures. We've got all kinds of crazy beliefs that in the long run, 
leads to not so good consequences. All right, I'll, I'll go into what these are so that you can start being mindful. Uh -huh, mindfulness there. <clears throat> you can start being mindful of the kinds of thoughts and beliefs that you have that may not lead to good consequences. And therefore, you might want to modify those beliefs into more uh, beneficial beliefs that brings you better consequences. All right, I'll give you more um, examples later. And then thirdly, of course, you know, there's the behaviors that you need to engage in so that by having a behaving in a certain way, you create um, an environment outside of yourself and within yourself that helps you sustain, be well for as long as you can. That's a good life, isn't it? All right. So there's community, there's rational thinking, there is healthy habits. Nine. Okay, so community, just to quickly recap, lots of recapping, huh? just to make sure it goes into your head. Friendship skills. You want to have collaborative problem solving. Don't solve by yourself. And this day and age, being in a pandemic, we really need to reach out for help. And we also need to um, respond to other people reaching out because, again, remember, a healthy community means a healthy you. If you don't help, they would suffer and eventually their suffering would you know, affect you and you would suffer too. So let's all help each other. We all live in a system, whether we like it or not. A healthy system is a healthy you. A healthy you contributes to a healthy system. So let's collaborate. When we want to solve problems, we can do it ourselves, yes. But every now and then, we are going to get stuck, myself included. When I get stuck, what do I do? I seek help. When I get stuck emotionally, what do I do? I seek help too. I go see a counselor, all right? Um, I, I can't really help myself sometimes. I need to get help from other people. And why do I see counselors? Because I know they're well-trained. They are professionally trained to be able to help people get unstuck. So I see them, you know. Yeah, basically look for help. There's, there's no shame in it. Because why coming back to community, to reduce that shame is to accept collaborative problem solving. And that's where we have got acceptance and belongingness. All right, so community aside, let's go into what you can do individually. Rational thinking. What is rational thinking? Basically having beliefs that help you cope with your day-to-day -day life. That's rational thinking. All right. It is not thinking good things. Yeah, it's not. A lot of people say, ah, you must have positive thoughts. Be positive. Positive in that sense does not mean thinking nice, fluffy, happy thoughts. No. Because by doing that, you are not being real, you're not being authentic, and you're not being rational. You cannot just simply cover things up with niceness when you are feeling horrible. That's not the thing to do, and that's being very unskillful. A skillful, a more skillful way to address anything that's uncomfortable is to investigate. And that's something that is very similar to what you probably learn in Buddhism. To look at it, to, to be curious, to find out what's going on there. I don't like it. I would like to get rid of it, but it's there. If you keep on pushing it away, it's still going to be there because it's just hidden. Maybe you can even grow stronger. So rational thinking is about understanding what's going on and finding a way to deal with it that has better consequences. For example, <clears throat> if you demand, all right, that a speaker must always look, always, 100% all the time, must always look presentable and formal, then you're probably going to be quite disappointed with me this morning. All right, I'm wearing a t-shirt, right? Um, if you demand that I look formal, then you are likely to be disappointed, okay? And remain disappointed because throughout the whole talk, you'll probably be ruminating in your head. And then, why are you still so informal? How dare he does this kind of thing? La, 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 complain, 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 complain. Now, what's the consequence of complaining? You probably will not be able to listen very much to my talk because you're complaining in your head. And what's the consequence? Other consequences? <laughs> Emotionally, you're upset. And uh, then you start complaining and, and maybe blaming me for making you upset. Okay. Um, that's the consequence. If you don't like that consequence, 
And if you were to look into some of the um, contributing factors, you will find that ultimately it's partially your demand that created this um, disturbance in you that you find very uncomfortable, okay? So a method of rational thinking would be to <clears throat> perhaps do something about that demand, about the belief that the speaker must be formal. Now, there's one way to deal with that. We all have our must and shoulds, our rules in life that we have been living by, that we have grown up with. And it's difficult, it's very difficult to modify them because we're so used to it already. Whether or not they bring you much unhappiness, we're still used to it. That's why I was saying earlier that, you know, we human beings are pretty messed up creatures. But if you grow up with that kind of demands, you know, very rigid rules that it has to be like, it must be like that. You know, when you say the word must, it comes a lot with force, isn't it? Should, must, ought to, have to, need to, absolutely must. It brings a lot of unnecessary force within you that if it is negative, you feel very negative. All right. So I want you to think about consequences. And if certain way of thinking and beliefs bring about consequences that are not nice, have a look again at the kind of beliefs you have and see how they bring about these consequences. Now, this involves a lot of insight. And those of you who are doing insight meditation will probably find all this out quite quickly because you're so used to being still and watching your thoughts and watching your feelings, watching your sensations to realize that this leads to that, this leads to that, that leads to this. I don't like the end product. So perhaps I can do something, you know, here. <clears throat> and in, in Buddhism, that's what we call paticca samupada, yeah, dependent originations. That's something that um, is very much done in psychology as well. It's in behavioral psychology. A leads to B, B leads to C, C leads to D. Something needs to be done. You could go back to A and do something about it. And in this case, when it comes to rational thinking, you want to look at beliefs and thoughts that are not as rational. And what are irrational thoughts? Thoughts that bring about a lot of upsetness and disappointment and frustrations. So an example of modification of the demand that the speaker must be formal could be, I mean, you may still want the speaker to be formal. You don't have to change your belief altogether by saying, ah, it's okay, they don't have to be formal. No, you can still have your wish by saying, it would be nice. It would be more proper, I feel, if the speaker were to dress more formally. But if he or she doesn't, it's okay. I don't have to get overly upset about it. I can live with it. Although I still feel that it will be good if they're more formal. So by thinking that or saying that, how do you think the consequence would be? Is it as strong as they must? Or is it slightly not so bad? Most people will say, hmm, it's, it's more sensible. Yes, I still have what I believe in, but I don't have to get overly upset or frustrated because of it. So what you're doing there is actually managing your emotions. You're managing stress if it is stressing you out. And stress is like fire. You know, it's good and bad. You need fire to cook. No fire, no cooking. Some of you may say, ah, we can have electric cooker, no problem. Yeah, fine. It's still some kind of fire that you manage. So I would say stress is like fire. You don't want to have a stress-free life. You know, without fire, it's difficult to live. But you need to be able to manage that fire so that it doesn't burn you. Stress is the same thing. There's good stress and there's bad stress. And um, you can't totally get rid of stress because you need stress to live, just like fire. So if that stress is too much, if the anger, the frustration is too much and you don't like it, you want to change things, have a look within yourself, your belief, and find out how is your belief leading to all of these things? If it's something that is not so good for you, don't like it, perhaps it could be some of your belief. And I would say many of us have got very extreme beliefs that lead us to a lot of trouble. And these extreme beliefs basically come in a form of demands, demanding three kinds of things, demanding that you be perfect, all right, I must be perfect. I must, for example, as a speaker, I must deliver the best talk ever. 
you know, online, live, without preparation, all right, from the heart, and people must clap in order for me to feel valued, I'm going to get really frustrated because every now and then I'm going to make mistakes. Guaranteed, because I'm human, I will make mistakes. But if I don't even allow myself to make mistakes, I demand myself to 100% be perfect, what do you think the consequences, consequences will be? There's a higher likelihood of me getting really upset at myself and probably the whole day starting to ruminate. Why, why, why? How can I do this? I never, I never ever talk to BGF ever again. I'm so, so frustrated with myself. I'm so, so ashamed. That could be the consequence. Is it necessary? No, it's not. It doesn't have to be like that. So stop demanding things of yourself. You can have wishes. You can have ambitions. It's fine. But if you don't meet your objective, if you don't meet your aim, your goal, if you don't get what you want, it's still okay. You can always try again. Yeah. If you practice this often enough, you will still get frustrated. Yes, because disappointment is part of life. Disappoint, disappointment, stress, frustrations, all these are very adaptive emotions. They are okay. Only if you blow them up, you get not so nice consequences. What is more skillful to do is to look into your frustrations and to make sense of it. Yes, I would have preferred to speak this way, to talk about this point and that point, but I did not. Never mind. Maybe next time I'll do better. Right? So there's still some sense of disappointment, but I can live with it and I can move on to do other stuff without having to ruminate the whole day and then that can like affect my relationship with other people as well and create all kinds of harm. So the point is, stop demanding yourself to be perfect, to not make any mistakes at all. If you do accept that you are disappointed, that's okay because that's a very natural feeling to have, disappointment. But manage it by saying, that's okay, I still don't like it, but I can. When you say I can, you are actively looking for some kind of a solution. I can always do this and do this and try again, all right? When you're actively looking for a solution, what you're doing there is what we call a productive activity. A productive activity is something that brings you forward. Forward means positive, and that's positive thinking, all right? Positive thinking is knowing how to deal with a situation and to move forward. <clears throat> it is not, you know, coming... I mean, seeing a bad situation and saying, <clears throat> that's good, actually. No, it's not good. It's not good if you don't feel good. So address it as it is. See it as it is. It is pain, it is pain. Don't say, ah, it's not pain, you know, can cover up the pain. You're going to probably feel more painful. <clears throat> right? Don't force pain away. <clears throat> Excuse me. Force, uh, don't, don't force anything. Look at the pain and see what you can do about it. Doing something about it is, again, progressive because you're doing something about it. You're um, actively looking for a solution. And that's progressive. That's productive. That's positive. I hope I've drummed into your heads that positive doesn't mean good. It means progressive. You are progressing to get better. All right? So stop demanding yourself. Try to keep on practicing. You will not succeed. You will fail every day. You will fail many times a day, but you can try again. I'm saying you will fail because I'm not promising you, <laughs> you know, 100% success. You will fail. Get used to failing. Get used to moving forward after you fail. Get up and go. Fall down, feel pain. Okay, feel bad for a while. Move on. Keep doing it. Keep practicing. After a while, it gets easier. And that's about rational thinking. <clears throat> Stop demanding yourself, stop demanding other people. The more you demand other people to be what you want them to be, the more likely you are going to get very upset and remain upset. Why would you want to do that? We don't want that. You don't want that kind of consequence. Do something about your demands. Change the way you think by that person must be like that. How dare that person do that? Mm. You know, that brings you to not so nice consequences. If you like those consequences, yeah, sure, carry on. But you know, most people don't. And these not so nice consequences would lead you to even worse consequence, usually. So instead of saying that person must do this, you can always say something like what I gave you just now. It would be nice if this person behaved this way. But this person didn't. I'm disappointed. 
but it's okay. I can do something about it. Not as bad, still bad, but not as bad. And that's by also understanding that you don't have to feel good. You don't have to feel joyful. You don't have to feel happy. Please don't demand yourself to be happy. That's one of the things that makes people unhappy, ironically. All right. If you feel unhappy, that's fine. Be aware of it. That's where mindfulness comes in. I'm not happy. Okay, so what, what can I do? Progress from there. If you demand yourself, I must be happy. How can this be? I've been, I've been a strong meditator. I'm still unhappy. How can this be? No, it hasn't. It cannot be like that. It mustn't be like that. Of course, you feel upset because you demand. So you demand on other people, you'll feel upset as well. And demand of life. Life shouldn't be like this. It's really been one year and a half and we're still in pandemic. No, shouldn't be. Must be, must not be. And why are people all being so stupid and not wearing masks? No, no, no. Consequences? Very upset. So rational thinking is about looking at all these demands that we have on the world, on life, on others, on yourself, and understanding where they come from and look at what are ways you can do to manage them to the point that it is more um, bearable that also helps you progress. So progress is not by only having positive feelings or nice, fluffy, kind, happy feelings. Progress is also something that is fueled by all other feelings, all other thoughts. We are work in progress. So unless we are irrational in regress, you know, it's not going to help us progress very much. All right. <clears throat> so I hope um, that's clear enough. The main thing is to practice. Practice, practice, practice. People ask me, Elvina, you're a psychologist. Do you ever get upset? Of course I do. I'm a human being. I can get upset to the point the whole day I'm upset. But what I can do, I know what to do is to look for methods in which I can be more rational, practice them, and then be less upset. Still upset, but less upset. And why don't I want to be not upset at all? Because there's just not realistic. It's not authentic. Upsetness is part of us. That's us, authentic feeling, and it's natural. Don't fight that nature. Don't demand that it goes away. It's part of life that helps you, again, progress. So if you demand yourself to be happy all the time, sure, go ahead. Um, but I must warn you, the consequence is not so nice. Mm. All right. Now, last part. Behavioral activation. It is a very, very powerful tool. And this is supported by research. Behavioral activation helps you maintain a good quality of life, regardless of the mood you are in. You don't have mood to do anything. Just do it. It is part of discipline. And this discipline is good. I say it's good because it's supported by lots of research evidence. It's not just say one. I'm saying this with data, all right? Years and years of data showing that if you focus on just behaving in a way, doing meaningful activities, regardless of your mood, you are likely to lift your mood quicker than just not doing anything, all right? Now, what are these healthy habits that I call behavioral activation? Things that you do to maintain your survival, as simple as that. Eat, sleep, rest, relax, exercise, find entertainment. Yes, entertainment is good for you, all right? But just don't get addicted. That's not adaptive. Eat, sleep, rest, relax, exercise, get entertained, learn. Learn something new, read, all right? Learn um, new skills here and there because that's adaptive. And what else can you do? Remember the first bit that we talked about? Socialize, make friends, keep friends, Keep connected. Stay safe, all right, by having physical distancing, but not social distancing. You want to stay home to stay safe, but stay connected to stay sane. So stay connected. Healthy habits involve socializing, involves entertainment. Have fun. It's good for you. Exercise. If you're afraid of exercise, never mind. Just have more physical activity. When you mop the floor, Mop with most, more gusto. Get your heart rate up every now and then. Keep on moving. Human beings are not made to sit 
and live a sedentary life. No, because when that happens, cognitively we decline. Yeah. You look at, like again, this one comes from research, old folks home. If you find old folks at any home, just sitting down, doing nothing, watching TV, they decline much quicker than those who are actually active doing something. Getting together, socializing, talking about life, playing games, all right, dancing. They maintain their cognitive abilities much better than those who are not doing anything. So if you want to live a good life, Move it, move it. Very important. So, and other stuff, of course, that contributes to your ability to eat, sleep, rest, relax, have entertainment, economic activities. Do stuff around you that helps you get resource. Resource is not just financial resource, but many other kinds of resource, like food and stuff. So you need to be doing your chores, running your errands. These are all very meaningful activities. And, you know, many people complain, ah, you have so much to do. Yes, these are the things you need to do in order for you to sustain your life. So look at it that way. Keep doing these things. And regardless of your mood, because when you put things in place, you have a healthy system around you that helps you to have, get you the resources you want. You are more likely to live a good life. So healthy habits doesn't just involve you taking care of your health your physical and mental health and your social health, it also involves you doing things that put things in place around you, all right? To, um, to organize your day, to organize other people's day, to organize your work day, your children, yeah? Put into your timetable in a day, entertainment, rest, sleep, relaxation, meditation, whatever that you do that sustains you. All these put in place contribute to a good life. So what do you need for a good life? Discipline. Yeah. You know, it is easier said than done, which is why, again, just like rational thinking, practice, practice, practice. Yeah. In, in Buddhism, you've got three times, you know, you've got the uh, namotasa one, there's the tutiampi, tatiampi. So practice, tutiampi, practice, tatiampi, practice. Practice, practice, practice all the way. Yeah, this life and next and whatever other life that you believe in. There you go. So to recap, the way to live a good life, socialize, very important, rational thinking, and healthy habits. Ta-da! Stuff that you all probably know already, but here I am just reminding you. These are important things to do. Again, regardless of mood. Mood, what you feel is momentary, is temporary. You don't need to let your mood dictate. If you, are, if you understand there are certain things to do that, that contributes to your overall quality of life, you do them. Now, this is where if you look at all kinds of religious practices, rituals, you know, things that you do, they're all important. You know, some people say, eh, rituals, or why must you do that kind of thing? But if you look at the consequence of doing this, all right, some people may not see chanting as necessary. Fine. But those who think it's necessary, they get something out of it. You're, you're chanting, you're being more mindful about what you chant about. And that's if you understand what you're chanting, that's even better. All right. Certain rituals that you do, some people may look at it and, and, and um, criticize. Well, the thing is, when you start criticizing, you're demanding that other people don't do what they do. What's the consequence? Mm, not so happy yourself. So, what you criticize for? Mm, not very skillful. Anyway. Um, what I'm trying to say is if you put things in place, you know, have a timetable in life and you follow the timetable, a routine of sort, that can help give you a better life. And if socialization is part of it, that's even better. So make sure in every day, you know, for every day, I'm not demanding of you, yeah? Just because I say make sure doesn't mean I'm demanding. And you don't have to demand yourself to. Kindly, gently, compassionately put these things in place and see what happens. And keep on practicing, keep on readjusting. We need to constantly readjust because balance is constantly in movement. Balance is not just one yin and yang like that that doesn't move. It is constantly moving. So in order for you to achieve balance, you have to keep on moving. And because balance is constantly in motion, you will lose balance every now and then, very often, in fact. So you know, achievement of balance is not a static moment. It is constantly moving with things. 
So community, socialization, rational thinking, healthy habits are constantly moving. There are many variables that you're not able to control, which is why there's no such thing as the best method. The best assumes that there are certain, everything can be controlled by you. No, it doesn't happen that way. But of course, um, you know, one of the best things, one of the best things, best, you know, I'm trapping myself with this four letter word called best, uh, to do is to manage yourself, manage your demands, manage your expectations, manage your beliefs. For that is something that helps you manage the rest of life, other people and the rest of the world. How to get, how to get a good life? Socialize, think rationally, and have healthy habits. The end. All right. Now I shall take questions. Oh, Bobby's got one. If a person doesn't yeah. have money, financial capability, to go to see a counselor, how would one go about this? Very good question, Bobby. You deserve a medal. This is a gold medal question. Olympics is over, but you can have a gold medal for this. There are many places you can seek help from that are free of charge. The first thing that comes to mind is this number, 15999. I repeat, 15999. It is also called Talian Kase. It is a free of charge service. They won't even charge you phone um, fees. These are national counselors who man these lines 24-7 to provide um, emotional support to people who may need them. So that's free. And uh, recently also, if you uh, look for Monash University, Malaysia, their counseling um, service, it is also open to public and your service is for free. These are students of the Masters in Counseling program at Monash University, Malaysia, and they are supervised by professional counselors. So you can be assured of professionalism and supervision from their supervisors who are professional counselors. That's free service as well. And they're pretty good. I've had friends going for it. I know them personally, just because they are students doesn't mean you know they are not good. They, they have gone through all kinds of practicals already and to learn skills and how to provide basic counseling, give them a try. There are also other places like, there you go, BGF. <laughs> so Bobby, maybe after this, you may want to tell the audience about the counseling service given by BGF. Um, there are also Christian organizations. There are uh, Muslim organizations, basically religious organizations, Many of them provide some form of counseling. Um, if you don't have very much money, you can go to government counselors. You probably just pay one ringgit for registration for life, just once. And then you can go have um, counseling from the counselors at local public hospitals and clinics. Um, AWAM, All Women's Action Society, they've got a counselor. WAO, Women's um, eight organizations. Somehow they are women's uh, organizations usually because I guess women are more caring and compassionate and do this kind of stuff. Uh, that's where we need more men <laughs> to come out and to provide help. So yeah, there are quite a number of uh, places. But at the same time, I would encourage all of you to make sure that wherever you're going to, the counselors are registered counselors. In Malaysia, uh, counseling the term counsellor is a protected term. No one can simply call themselves a counsellor. I cannot call myself a counsellor because in order to do so, I need to be a registered counsellor under Lembaga Counselling Malaysia. So if people are not um, registered, if they call them a counsellor, I would avoid them because you know there's no guarantee that they are trained professionally and they are not recognised. All right. Okay, so I hope that answers a question, a long answer to a short question. So we have got a question here from Felicia Tai. Over the years, I've cut friendship with three old friends. Is there something wrong with me? No. If you cut friendship, then you're probably being kind to yourself. Um, here, here's something that we tend to suffer from also, demanding that we be right all the time. 
to the point that when you feel there's something wrong with you, you get very, very disturbed. There's no need to disturb yourself any further. If you cut ties with friends, okay, um, may be good for you. But if you feel bad about it, then I would suggest you seek help to make sense of why is it that you feel so bad about cutting friendships? You know, some, some friends are very toxic. And, and you only find out that they're toxic usually after a long while because um, people who are toxic are also very smart. <laughs> they know how to manipulate you to the point that you don't even know um, that they are toxic. You feel as though you are the one at fault. And if you realize that they are not the kind of friends you want, you want to cut ties with them, sure, go ahead. That's being compassionate to yourself. Nothing wrong with that. But if you still have this nagging feeling that there's something wrong, wrong with you, I would suggest to seek help. And it's okay to seek help. I seek help too. Sometimes I feel that there's something wrong with me. I seek help, then I realize there's nothing wrong with me. It's just me being kind to myself. Hmm. So allow yourself to be kind to yourself. It's okay. That's very good. Make more friends. You feel that those three friends are lost, make more friends. Hey, we've got A.L. Chan. L. Chan. How to help a person who has OCD? Um, well, OCD is a very serious disorder, all right? Obsessive compulsive disorder. I hope that when you say OCD here, you really mean the person has a diagnosed disorder. Don't simply diagnose people as OCD. You're not a professional. Right, so if a person, I'm assuming, has uh, OCD and how to help, this is where I suggest you learn more about what OCD is about and what are some of the typical treatments that I use to help people with OCD. And the gold standard method that we know um, that helps people with OCD is this method called exposure and response prevention, all right? Part of therapy is to help them be exposed to things that increases their anxiety and prevent their response of compulsion, such as hand washing, counting, and many other kinds of compulsion. So the term obsessive compulsive disorder basically shows you there are two, there are two categories, I mean, there are two components of the disorder. One is obsession, obsess about certain things. And compulsion is must do something about the obsession. Otherwise, anxiety is very high. So OCD is a kind of anxiety disorder and the compulsions are there to reduce anxiety. But because the compulsions are so disruptive, you know, treatment is to reduce the compulsion, the compulsive behavior, so that they're much better able to go through their life to be more uh, productive and adaptive. All right. So part of what you can do as a layperson to help someone with OCD is firstly to help them relax, do things with them to help them relax because OCD is an anxiety disorder. And the opposite of anxiety is relaxation. So teach the person, be with the person in a way that helps the person relax. All right? And also be rational with the person. Stop demanding the person to not be OCD because that increases their anxiety. That's one way. Um, and yeah, like I said, please read up on OCD. I can't tell you everything to do in this short time. But Yes, get yourself literate on OCD. Um, speak to a mental health professional yourself in learning how to do it. Or offer, offer to go for the therapy sessions that your friend with OCD goes for so that you can sit in a session and learn about what you can do. For me, when it comes to any kind of treatment, it should by right involve the family, friends, colleagues, because recovery of any kind of mental illness is not in the clinic. Recovery is within the community. And unless the community knows what to do, it's going to be hard for any individual with any kind of mental illness to recover. So this is a very good question, L. Um, get your bunch of friends, whoever, to go learn about what we can do. Too many people are so afraid of mental illness that they just shun people who are diagnosed. Feeling helpless and hopeless. You don't have to be that way. You can be positive by progressing yourself, learn more about what OCD is about. All right. Maybe next talk we can talk about OCD. I won't have time to answer everything here. Would hypnosis assist? All right. Past failures, emotional stress, regrets, 
Okay, got L Chan again. Hypnosis is what we call an adjunct uh, treatment. Adjunct means like an add on, like a vitamin. It is not the main treatment. And the thing is, not everybody can be hypnotized. Some people who are very blurred cannot imagine things on, very difficult to hypnotize them. Um, some people are very easily hypnotized. How do you know? If I were to suggest some things to you and you can feel my suggestions, you're probably almost hypnotized by then. Like imagine to yourself now, you are licking this very sweet and delicious cookies and cream ice cream. Mm. And you go, oh, so nice. There you go, you're hypnotized already because you, you accept my suggestion. But anyway, coming back to hypnosis or hypnotherapy, hypnosis and hypnotherapy are two separate things. Hypnosis is just for the fun of it. Hypnotherapy is where you use hypnosis as a healing method to help the person be better. But hypnosis alone will not help you, um, you know, cope with past failures, emotional stress, or any kind of regrets. Hypnosis alone will not be able to do it. It may help you go back to, or it may help you focus on certain failures and talking about it. It is merely a tool. It is not treatment per se. All right, I hope that's, that's clear to you. A lot of people think, wow, hypnosis, there's this mysterious thing. Wow, must be very powerful. No, hypnosis is powerful, but it is an adjunct treatment. It is not the main treatment. And there's no such thing as a main treatment, actually. Treatment is basically a bunch of adjuncts together. Although uh, there are certain things that are considered as treatment, for example, cognitive and behavioral therapy, which is a combination of cognitive therapy and behavioral therapy, just put together. Um, because we know from research, again, just cognitive therapy alone without the behavioral part doesn't do as much as a combination. And we also know that for certain mental illness, there's cognitive behavioral and also medication therapy together. At the same time, like I said, recovery is in the community, not in the clinic. So you need to have medication, cognitive behavioral therapy, as well as social therapy, socialization, and helping uh, to, to rehabilitate. Social rehabilitation is something that is one of the most important part of therapy. So that's what we look at. Hypnosis, again, is like one small, tiny creature within this thing called treatment, right? For older people, forming new relationship would probably be the greatest challenge. Any advice? Hmm. Yeah, it's a challenge because perhaps there's intergenerational gaps. Um, advice would be to facilitate, to get someone who's familiar with uh, the elderly person to... Um, introduce to facilitate friendship making. So that's one. Um, and bring the person out, which is a bit difficult these days because we're all supposed to be isolated at home. Yeah. Uh, use technology. Use Zoom. Again, it's very tricky because I would like my parents to know how to Zoom with their friends, but they are so averse to technology that, you know, they are they find it more frustrating than, than, you know, that it is useful. So it is tricky. Um, <clears throat> and it doesn't help that, you know, being older, it takes a longer time to learn how to use technology. They forget. My father forgets within five minutes. So, you know, it is tricky. Um, but we can always just keep trying to facilitate. Pick up the phone, call them. They don't know how to form new ones, you form you know, with them, call them, talk to them, and then introduce them to somebody else, call them, talk to them as well. Um, basically, keep in touch. Start keeping in touch, just talking. And some people like telling their life stories. That's okay. That's really good, actually. Um, what I used to do was, well, before the pandemic, sometimes I'll just invite friends over to my parents' place and just talk to them. They like meeting new people. They're curious. And um, my dad, for example, likes to talk. But now it's kind of hard because, you know, you can't simply invite people to the house and people calling up might be scam people. So, yes, it is tricky. I don't have all the answers for it, but that's part of what I can say as advice. Um, be 
proactive in facilitating friendships. Get them to join clubs. Remember the five C's of good life and socialization. Okay, <clears throat> we have got another 22 minutes. Feel free to ask questions. This is a free service from BGF. Usually people pay tons of money to listen to me and ask me questions, but here you have me for free on a Sunday morning. I can easily charge like triple rate because it's a Sunday. <laughs> Older people lose their sharing as well. Yeah, and they tend to keep to themselves. How? Mm. Again, you need to be proactive and be with them. It is easier said than done, but there are so many challenges, isn't it? Losing their hearing. And that's how we are as human beings. We are very irrational beings. We lose our hearings, then we give up. It's like, I don't want to talk to anybody anymore because it's just too hard. So easier for me to just keep quiet. But in keeping quiet, suddenly there's isolation. <clears throat> and isolation, like I said earlier, is not good for us. This is forced isolation. It is like, you demand yourself to be isolated because you're so afraid of hearing and saying the wrong things. Um, that is something that needs to be broken in a way, you know. So if, if they don't want to talk, fine, but you can just be with them. Just being around can be very helpful. You don't even have to say anything. You know how sometimes you know, people with pets, cats and dogs, they just sit next to you and when you try to pet them, they go... <laughs> They don't like it. Um, it's kind of like that sometimes when you want to interact and connect, they don't want it, but all they want is just to be next to you. Perhaps that's something that they need. They don't want to talk, that's fine. Please don't force them to talk. But you can just keep them company. Again, in this day and age, it's so difficult to do that because we are isolated. But where you are not isolated, it's helpful to just be there. <coughs> All right, Eddie's got a question. Mm, there are people got cheated, usually women going to a market, met someone, spoken to them, yeah, later went back home, take cash, pass to the person. Yeah, okay, neighbor even went to the bank, withdraw fund. Okay, what kind of psychology methods that this scammer use? Friendship, promise of friendship. That shows you how strong the need for socialization is to the point that when people offer you their friendship, you take it and you trust the person straight away. So it's not a particular trick at all. This is, uh, I would say, a very age old method to scam people and that's by being a friend. Sad to say, all right? There's no mysterious psychology method. It is basically an offer of friendship that um, the person used to take advantage of another person. Think about child abuser, same thing. They offer friendship. They, what do you call that? It's, it's what you call as, um, oh, I forget the term now, but it's like nurturance to make you trust the person enough to give yourself, to give money. Yeah. And, you know, often when you look at the victims, they are usually people who already perhaps feel kind of like isolated and um, rejected to the point that suddenly when somebody shows them acceptance, it's like, oh, wow, this person is so nice, you know, I'm going to help this person. Or a victim could also be someone who really enjoys giving, who feel that, you know, if somebody sees them as important, they want to be important, they, they go for it. So it's not about um, the method of scamming. It's also about the victim of the scam. Certain people are more easily victimized. That's how it is. Like, you know, when you answer a phone and someone talks to you, for me, I'm, I'm very sensitive. You offer me something that I don't need, I'll say thank you very much, goodbye. Um, and partly it's also to do with personal greed, I suppose. You know, people offering you money and then, no, I don't need it. Uh, go give somebody else. Go give to some charity. I don't need the money. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Okay, more and more questions coming in. We've got Xiao Jun. Uh, being a very capable person, sometimes participate in group community, invites a lot of requests or demands from others, which I find physically and mentally draining. How am I able to juggle between fulfilling others and my own family needs? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's difficult to juggle, like I was saying earlier. 
Um, it's about finding the balance. This is where you investigate and you learn uh, your own lessons and to know when to say no, how to say no, and fixing a time for yourself. This is where healthy habit comes in. Healthy habits is not just about doing the things, but organizing yourself. Put your, have a timetable that then shows you how much you're able to do something and be realistic. I'm still struggling with it, I must say. You know, I have this timetable, but I don't see that between this activity and this activity, I need some time to rest first. And once you are better, you're more aware of yourself, then you start getting the skill to provide yourself with a buffer time. And this buffer time, no one disturbs you. You're not going to say, yes, okay, I can slot you in here. Oh, <laughs> you're going to be very drained by the end of the day. I know because I make that kind of mistake a lot. All right. So it's about organizing, it's about planning. And again, you will fail again and again and again. So allow yourself to fail and keep on learning. It's, it's um, work in progress. Not easy, but learn to say no. And this is where I think Bobby has learned to only ask me to give talk once a year because I say yes to other people the rest of the year. Um, I want to give to as many groups as possible, but I cannot possibly give that many talks. In fact, this whole month of August, I think I've given too many talks already. You see this? I'm tired. Yeah. Last night, also, I gave a talk. Uh, I, I lost count of the number of talks I've given this August on top of the lectures I gave and, and so many other things. I'm doing too much. Yeah, so Xiao Jun, I'm probably also like you, or maybe worse, um, because you are a capable person, no doubt. Um, all right, same questions asked twice, tries. Grooming, yes, yes, Bobby, well done. Grooming is the word that child abusers use to um, get trust from children. Grooming. All right, so we got Chai Hoon, mom is forgetful. Not remember where she keeps two handphones. Yeah, when phone, one handphone is bad enough, two, of course, you probably, you know, leave here and there. We found them at times, but they are often misplaced. Yeah, it's taking time to find them. You think someone keeps them on purpose. Mm. You see, when you have all kinds of irrational beliefs, when younger, you start having um, a lot more irrational ones as you grow older because you become more used to it. And there's also a sense of anxiety. There's a sense of not knowing what's going to happen towards um, you know uh, elderly ages. Um, there is this sense of loss of control. It's very common, and when you have a sense of the loss of control, um, there's also a higher likelihood that you feel other people are trying to control you. And so, when some things get lost, you probably have this belief that people are doing this on purpose. It's, it's part and parcel of aging, which can be reduced and prevented by being um, mentally active, socially active. But sometimes, no matter what you do also, like I said, there's no best way because you lose to biology, to our genetics. You know, there are a lot of things within our body that we can't control that may happen at any time. So part of it is perhaps um, loss of cognitive ability. And so back to the question, sorry. Uh. Then she will say bad words on that person, also ask for a new phone, how best to handle. Again, there's no best way, I'm sorry. Best is a four-letter word. It is a word that clouds you to potential solutions or rather other potential solutions. There's no best way to handle. I would say, please investigate what's going on. All right, I cannot answer your question, really. I'm going to be very realistic about this. I don't know your situation. You can tell me a bit of this, but that's not enough for me to tell you exactly what to do. Even if I know, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly what to do. I need to investigate together with you, look for potential solutions, try them, because these solutions that are potential are not necessarily something that would work. That's the reality of it. So I will go back to my earlier point on community and this is collaborative problem solving. So you might want to get help from your other family members, from friends to see what you can do to handle this. If they say some bad words to that person, how big a problem is it? It may be a very big problem if you demand that your mom doesn't use bad words. But if that's how your mom is, perhaps you can then live with it 
perhaps, yeah, I'm not saying you must, you know, live with it by saying, I would like it if my mom doesn't use curse words or bad, word, bad words, but, you know, given her cognitive functioning at the moment, she may not know what she's doing. So what we can do would be perhaps to modify her behavior by using behavioral modification methods. And this is something that you may want to speak to a psychologist about. Psychologists are experts in behavior modification. Hmm? Counselors are not so. There's a difference between counselors and psychologists. Counselors mainly deal with your emotions. Psychologists deal with your behaviors and thoughts. Um, and I'm not a person, yeah, because I'm not practicing. So that's one thing that I can suggest. Uh, Vicky, uh, could you give some information about schizophrenia? What are the reasons for that disorder and how to overcome it? All right. Now, as I said earlier, many things contribute to how we are as a human being, our well-being and our illness. So schizophrenia is, um, I would say, a, a disorder that is very much to do with our brain function. <clears throat> there are many reasons that contribute to schizophrenia, um, biological, psychological, and social, all combined together. Biological would be your genetic predisposition to schizophrenia. But just because you have got a family history of it doesn't mean you will become schizophrenic. It depends on your psychosocial setting and your upbringing and things like that. Some we can control, some we can't control. But if you already do have schizophrenia, the schizophrenia is basically the um, formal or official diagnosis of what most people understand as crazy. So in schizophrenia, I'm just going to be a bit technical here. There are two categories of symptoms. One category is called positive symptom, which doesn't mean good. All right, positive means it's there. You can see like having positive COVID. All right, you can see it. Uh, these symptoms include hallucinations, which means you can see things, hear things that other people don't see. You can even feel things on your skin that other people cannot see you feeling, all right? Brain doing that to you. It's kind of like you are dreaming in daylight. You know how your dreams don't make sense, right? Yes, can you imagine you're dreaming in daylight? You see things and hear things and you see life around you, you being in a place that other people don't see because you're dreaming in daylight. Can you imagine how crazy that would get? That might get you very scared or get other people very scared because you're talking to stuff that's not there. That's hallucination. Delusion is also another part of those symptom uh, category. Delusions is where you think you are someone you are not. Like I may think I'm Spider-Man. I'm clinging to a wall, right? Uh, something that's put man, they try to fly and then they fall. Um, so that's delusions. And third one is what we also call, um, sorry, they're not really in, in that symptom group, but we can put it in. Um, disorganized behavior. Behavior disorganized, thoughts disorganized, speech disorganized. I can come out and talk nonsense, total nonsense to you. Like I can say, you know, broccoli is blue in color because my t-shirt is blue because tigers are very nice animals that drink coffee and have ice cream together with a computer. Yeah, totally disorganized. Um, so that's part of schizophrenia. The other part of schizophrenia is what we call the negative symptoms, which are not really seen. These are symptoms that, you know, uh, prevent them from doing anything at all. They move very slowly. They may not talk. They may not want to take care of themselves, brush teeth or bathe. They are just like not doing anything. There's no motivation to want to talk. Uh, they may move like a snail or they may be even what we call catatonic, like, you know, rocking or being in a very odd position for a long time. That's catatonic. So schizophrenia is a combination of all those symptoms. I hope that makes sense. Okay, our past behaviors seem to lead to what we are today in lockdown. Uh, what behavioral activation is paramount to cope? Okay, no starting at paramount again. No best, no paramount. Let's, let's, let's focus on what we can do instead to cope with a new norm. Healthy habits. Do the things that you do every day that has been keeping you alive until now. Get enough sleep, get enough rest. Rest and sleep are two different things. Have time to rest. Um, <clears throat> be still for those of you who are meditating. Um, eat healthy foods, exercise, read, learn something, carry on doing these things. 
just basically carry on doing the stuff that's keeping you alive and keeping you well. Nothing special. Carry on. Um, carry on making friends. Carry on connecting with friends. Do that even more so now, actually. You want, you want to talk about Paramount? Connection is very important. Easier said than done because I'm also not doing it as well as I should. I should be calling up more friends and talking to them. All right. Um, that's what I would like, but I'm so busy these days that I haven't got time. And my only time to connect is like giving talks like this. That also is connecting to like many people, um, although I don't see them. Okay, so PS Lee, please continue doing what you do. You feel that something is less, let's do more of them. You will know from the consequences of what you do. So carry on doing things that are healthy, put things in place. Be disciplined about it. But like I said, anything extra would be connection. Right, so Jane, so how to cope living with family members who are always demanding things on the place according to this way and that way, otherwise get angry and start nagging. Yeah, just walk away may not help in the long run. Walk away may help temporarily. Is it healthy to stay just stay quiet? No, it is not healthy because, you know, you are probably... Uh, maintaining the problem as well to tolerate. Yes, having a, um, a low or rather a high frustration tolerance would help, but there's only so much you can tolerate. Um, this is where, again, collaborative problem solving is something I would recommend. Again, it is easier said than done. You will fail, but you can always try again. So problem solve. I find that a lot of people, when they ask questions such as this, expect a solution to be done and it should work like straight away. I'm not saying that you are, um, but it's a very common um, expectation. And this is where the demands on yourself also, you need to keep it in check. I would say problem solve. And I can't tell you the solution straight away again because I don't live with your family. I don't know how things are, who are there, who gets angry, who starts nagging. Some people get angry and start nagging because they haven't got very much insights. And that's how we are as human beings. We, there's so much diversity that um, there's no such thing as the best method because there's diversity. There's diversity in intelligence, in personality, in beliefs. And for anyone to impose any beliefs on others is going to usually cause a lot of friction and conflicts. So part of what we can do is also to learn how to manage conflicts and how to be assertive enough to help other people see things from your point of view. They don't have to agree with you, but you know sometimes it helps for them to just know how you feel about things. They may still want their own way, but one of the steps that's a very big step to take is to let other people know how you feel. Sometimes they, take, they need to take time to think about it before responding they may scold you fine but that's just how they respond a lot of people's responses are very automatic and you know they've learned to respond that way for a long time already they're not going to change overnight so it's a lot to go through it is not easy it takes practice but try solving that problem as a collective you know together if you know directly cannot then get help from outside you can get help from you know a professional someone I would call a family therapist, not many around, you know. Um, all these things that I'm suggesting is very, uh, what do you call that? Foreign to a lot of people, like seeking help outside. It's not just not part of our culture. It is very much a Western culture, but not an Asian culture because we, we are told to not um, do our dirty laundry in public. And public may even mean professional. But I would urge you to seek help. And asking me a question like this, hopefully is, is a way to also trigger off um, potential solutions because I don't have the solutions for you. Again, I need to be authentic and realistic. I don't have the solutions for you. I cannot tell you exactly what to do, but you know, problem solve as, as uh, in collaboration with, with the person you have difficulties with or with a neutral party. All right. Um, <clears throat> Meta Buddhist Fellowship, Eric Lu, how to overcome intrusive thoughts? You don't overcome them. You welcome them in and investigate what they are about. Otherwise, you just ignore them. But you don't overcome them. They will come and go, not your control. So intrusive thoughts, what you do, 
um, one of the ways, of course, is to have uh, mindfulness and to practice meditation. It does help. When you meditate, it's not about stopping these thoughts because when you stop these thoughts, it's also a use of force. In meditation, there's no force. There's a lot of gentleness. Sit there, watch, or just focus on your breath. The thoughts will come and go. You don't need to allow them to disturb you. They will come, they will go. Eventually, you realize that they come and they go and that's about it. It's just like the air that goes into your nose and out your nose. Are they intrusive? No, they are not. They are very adaptive. If you don't breathe, you die. <clears throat> so thoughts are pretty much the same. You don't have to disturb them. Thoughts are only intrusive if you, if you disturb them. If they come and go, they're no longer intrusive. Does it make sense? So it's again about your belief and your attitudes towards whatever that happens to you. See if that helps. You know, Practice it again, you will fail. Not many speakers tell you you will fail, but I will. You will fail again and again. It's about trying again and again. It's about practice and practice. I feel all the time, a lot. Like even now, I'm probably failing to answer your questions, but that's okay because I don't have the answers. What can I do? Right. But thanks for asking. That's a very good thing, very common question that I hope you know you can also share with others. I lose my patience with my brother who has depression for years because he's not trying to do things to improve exercise and stuff. I have stopped talking to him. Please advise. Mm. <clears throat> not sure what to advise you on. You have stopped talking to him. I can assume that you are probably wanting to talk to him again or you just want him to do something about his life. Yeah, it would be nice if he does something for himself. That would be nice. But sometimes because of our own strong demands that they must do something for themselves, we get upset to the point that we cut ties or we stop talking to him because we are the ones getting frustrated and, and perhaps angry. And you don't like feeling that way. You lose patience. There are many things that we can do about this. One thing is to be aware of your own losing patience. We tend to get angry quickly, tend to lose patience quickly because it has been there for a long time. We are familiar with anger, therefore we feel angry easily. We are familiar with losing patience because uh, it has happened a lot to the point we are so familiar with it. Now, one of the things to do about reducing being angry easily is to be familiar with other stuff that's opposite of anger, for example, calmness. So help yourself be calm, get more familiar with it, because the more familiar you are with calmness, the more likely you are going to feel calm more easily, just like how you feel anger. That's for yourself. For your brother, what to do? Well, one of the things that is usually uh, reaction to anyone who's depressed, who remain depressed is frustration. You are frustrated with your brother because he's not doing the things that you would like him to do. And because he's not doing the things that he would like, you would like him to do, um, you react in what can be called a form of rejection. You stop talking to him, that's rejection. A person who is depressed is usually depressed because they have lost the sense of belongingness. All right. Now, Please don't blame yourself. That's the first thing not to do. Please don't blame yourself because you are reacting in a very, very usual and natural thing to do that anyone would do. But have a look at his perspective. When someone is depressed, and this is for everyone who normally asks me, what do you do with a person who's depressed? My first answer would be to accept him or her as they are first. Because the reason why they remain depressed is because they are already being rejected. They already feel rejected themselves. They reject themselves already. It's not you rejecting them. But if there are even more rejection that comes from outside, it just confirms that he is to be rejected and therefore stays depressed. And being depressed, part of the symptom is to feel that you just don't want to do anything at all. There's no mood to do anything. I don't want to exercise. I don't want to eat. If I eat, I just eat a lot. I don't care. The whole mentality is I don't care. It's apathy. There's no care. And when I don't care, I go into a rut, a cycle of depression. Because if I don't care for myself, no one's going to care for me. It means I hate myself. And I hate myself for hating myself. So it, you go downwards. What you can do if you want to help your brother to get out of that is to show care. Not just you. Get other people to. You can just be next to him, to accept him as the way he is. 
it may take time, a long time. And that's part of what we also do in the clinic. People who are depressed sometimes just don't want to talk to us at all. They sit there, they're slumped in the seat, they're looking down, and we're just, we're just there. Sometimes we talk, after a while, we don't talk anymore, we just be with them. It's about acceptance. Try that and see. It may not work, but at least there is someone who's accepting them. That's a very, very important and very strong thing, uh, method that you can try. Acceptance and validation. Validate that they are depressed. Validate that they have got no more to do anything. And that's okay because you are there for them in case they need anything. So this is where you bring up compassion. Obviously, you want him to be as comfortable as possible. But because you lost patience, because you were frustrated, it's kind of like you give up. I would urge you to try again, to just say, hey, you know, you may even want to apologize if you want to. I'm sorry for not talking to you, but here I am. Is there anything I can do to help your life uh, be better? Anything I can do to help you be more comfortable? He may well say, no, I don't talk to you ever again. But you can persist and say, look, I would want you to be comfortable. Can I come over there and give you some food and stuff like that? And you do it. Even if he doesn't want to accept the food, fine. You know, you can accept him being that way. So start with acceptance. Um, that's where compassion really comes in. Give it a try. It's not easy. You will fail again. This speaker tells people they will fail one. Not very encouraging, isn't it? But that's, that's reality. I'm not going to lie. So hopefully that helps. Okay, Yan Chin. How to help children keep a distance from computer games. Mm. You're not helping them, actually. <laughs> they probably get very upset. So it's not helping. Helping yourself. <clears throat> but, okay. Computer games are very attractive. It is entertainment. And it is fun. So if you want them to stop playing computer games, you need to replace their computer games with something that's equally fun and entertaining, which is very difficult. And this is where healthy habits come in to make sure that everyone gets some kind of a responsibility or role to play in the day that contributes to everybody's well-being and just do it. Have structure at home. Have time for computer games, but it must be time for other things as well. And how you time things, how you do your timetable also has got um, effect. Like how you have got timetable at school. If you have maths just before physical education, Maths become attractive because you must do maths first before physical education, which is the most fun thing. So if you put something that's not so fun just before computer games, then the not so fun thing gets to be done much more than computer games. And have food come after computer games. Usually that helps because they have to have food. And when you have food, you stop computer games because you're going to focus on food. And then you go on to do something else again that's not computer games. So play around with your timetabling at home. Um, if you're not too sure how to do this, uh, again, you can consult a psychologist because this is part of behavioral modification. That's what psychologists do. All right, hope that helps. This lockdown gives us opportunity to learn, to just be, all right? But there is a feeling that old people used to say, waiting to die every day, repeat old routine. Yeah, okay, mentality. Okay. Now, old people also used to say you must work, work, work because that is the confusion thing to do. If you, you know, this is like Confucius say, you must work hard, live hard. Yeah, in a way. But if you look at data, I'm coming to you from the psychological perspective and from the research perspective. We know that the equation towards productivity doesn't just include work. Work plus rest plus play plus self-care plus socialization, plus work, plus self-care, plus rest, plus socialization. And of course, in between, must eat. All these are part of the equation for productivity. So when you are resting, you are contributing to your own productivity. If you just work plus work plus work plus work, it does not equal to productivity because it's more likely to equal to death. That's also shown to be true. Overworking has brought death to 
a lot of people, a few thousand people, I think 600 over 1,000 people per year. That's from stats. So you look at data, it shows that working by yourself is not something that leads to productivity. If you look at the equation for productivity, it includes rest, just being. Yeah. Well, look back at Buddhism. If you're Buddhist, Buddha didn't say meditate for life. <laughs> Yeah, there's the old Zen saying, before enlightenment, chop wood, fetch water. After enlightenment, chop wood, fetch water. Because if you don't do all these things, you'll die. Right? What's the point of dying after you know enlightenment? Um, yes. So old people used to say, waiting to die if you don't do anything. Older people used to say, chop wood, fetch water. Still things that you need to do. To keep on living. Rest is one of them. Sleep is one of them. Eating, playing, right? Exercising. These are all healthy habits. And you want to change that mentality? Show data. Show numbers. Speak with data, not with conviction. That's for convicts. Right? Just a joke. All right, great. So it's 11.39. I've gone 10 minutes past. Any last questions? I can go on and on actually, but you know, BGF has to close. <laughs> All right. If no more questions, then I'll pass this back to Bobby. Thank you very much, all of you, for your kind attention. And um, yeah, apologies if I were to have caused disturbance in your force. I wish you all peace, kindness, compassion, gentleness, and joy throughout the day. And enjoy the rest of the Sunday. Bye bye. <clears throat> BGF helpline. Okay. This is our BGF helpline, so if you have uh, any needs to call in for uh, just to someone to listen, this, you can call up these two numbers. Okay, so thank you everyone for dialing in and uh, see you again next month.